We're just going to welcome everybody as uh, the last few come in and find their seats. Um, we just want to say how excited we are um, as a member of the Elders Board. Uh, my name's Nathan. Uh, I just want to welcome you to Oxford. It's nice that we can meet outside. Um, I know it's a little bit chilly. Will's got his sweater on and his hot hot coffee. <laughs> So we just thank you for we just thank the Lord for uh, being able to be out here, enjoy the war enjoy the sunshine, see everybody's faces, and uh, worship together. Um, of the following are a few updates, just some ministry stuff as we get into this summer. Um, we've got quite a few of, of quite a few events planned. Um, so if you're a youth and you're uh, you're wanting to be a part of the uh, LIT camp um, for grades six to twelve, um, it's about it's a time for kids to learn how to teach others about Christ and how to have a relationship with Him. Um, but it's also a camp where there's a lot more of time for including games, crafts, events, and then an end of the week um, outing to a water park. So if you're wanting to sign up for this again, grades uh, six to twelve then your deadline for that camp to sign up is uh, June 19th. Um, the other two camps, which are VBS, uh, the I Wonder Camp is held the 18th to the 22nd. Um, they are going to be an amazing time of learning um, through exploration and discovery and experimenting. Um, there's also an end of the week for that camp, which will be to the uh, Twin Valley Zoo, which is in Brantford. The On the Case camp will be, um, will be solving mysteries about God and wondering about him. Um, and then the end of the week for that camp will also end in a trip to Twin Valley Zoo. So if you like animals, Gloria, do you like animals? Go to the camp. For these camps that I mentioned, um, there is still quite a, quite a need for volunteers. Um, so if you're able to volunteer, uh, whether it's I think snacks or uh, running a station or leading a group. Um, make sure to reach out to Mary um, and uh, let her know what, what you're available to do or ask her what spaces that she's needing to be filled. Um, and she can kind of give you a list of, of where, where we're needing uh, people, to, to, people to serve. And then, uh, and then you, we can plug you in somewhere. Also for our youth, the youth get all the fun things, eh? Where's the seniors events? Although I'm not a senior. If you're in the youth, um, they are they're hosting the uh, Wednesday night fireside campfire uh, meetings. What they're looking for is, I think, families to host at their house um, on a Wednesday night, a location that the youth could meet at and have a campfire at. So if you're looking to have a whole bunch of youth come to your house and have a fire, sign up for that. So that's at oxfordbaptist.ca uh, forward slash firesides, or I, I would assume you could talk to Tyler or uh, one of the other youth leaders about that, getting, getting your name on that list. Um, I know M and I, we used, to, we used to help out with youth. It's an energetic group and, uh, and a lot of fun. So I, if you want to do that and host, uh, host one of those campfires, then get on that list. And then lastly, the ladies. Um, there's a ladies' night July 8th. Um, it's an outdoor one. Um, and it's going to be another campfire, uh, which will be on this on this property. Um, so bring a if you're planning to come, bring a friend, and uh, they would like to um, have you register on the website as well. I'm assuming there's probably a link on the website for that. And then this morning, Tyler will be leading us in uh, as we continue our Acts series. And uh, if you don't mind, then we'll just bow our heads and uh, welcome Lord into our hearts as we uh, start with some worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, this sunny morning. We just thank you for this property, the ability for us to, to meet um, as, we, as we worship you. Prepare our hearts um, for the words that you are going to uh, speak through Tyler to us. Um, allow, it to, allow it to work in our minds and our hearts and uh, that we go from here um, prepared for the week ahead to, uh, to do your will. So we just pray for our, our worship. Uh, we pray that uh, it glorifies you um, with the songs that we sing. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, team. I just want to welcome up uh, Rob Cole for the uh, a building ministry update. Um, for those of you that aren't at, uh, aren't part of our membership, we had a ministry update um, at our semi-annual meeting or annual meeting this past Wednesday. Um, we're grateful, I think, to the team and the committees that are 
doing a lot of the work that's uh, all the planning that uh, is going to happen on this property. Um, while Rob's doing his update, I won't forget, let the JK to grade five uh, meet with Mary at the back and uh, go through that back door for uh, their Sunday their Sunday service. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, I could use the help. It's good to see everybody, isn't it? Nice to be outside and meeting again in the, in the great outdoors. <clears throat> so why are we building a building? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> and there's even a nice breeze today, which is great, though it does cause havoc with my hair. But uh, I think we'll survive. I think we'll survive. So I just, yeah, as Nate said, we had a semi-annual meeting this week, and we did give a, a building committee presentation. So we just want to give you an update, because not everybody was able to be at that meeting. And my co-chair, Jen, is not able to be here this morning. And Allison from the capital campaign was there, too. So I'm feeling a little bit alone today as I'm doing this by myself. Uh, but we'll, we'll get through it. So on behalf of the building committee, I just uh, I want to give you a bit of a, probably just a summary of our presentation. We had PowerPoints and everything, and we can't do that here. And so I'll try to keep the numbers to a minimum so I don't overwhelm you and confuse you with all the numbers that we threw out at everybody. Um, so first of all, you can see that there is still some work going on. As you drove in, you can see that some excavation is still happening. Um, we have the fire tanks have now been filled and buried. You can just see the tops of them uh, as you drive in. So there's, there's still progress being made on that, on that front. Uh, it's hard to believe that it was back in 2018 when we first met with our construction management company, gave them all the information, we got the architects involved, and we got our initial budget. And it, it seems, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it was back in 2018 we did that. And at that time, our original budget uh, came in at about $4.4 million, which did not include this land, because this land at that point had already been paid for. Um, so that was just the cost of building our church building and getting it ready for us to be able to occupy it. Uh, as anybody who's been involved in renovation projects know, Things have been really challenging since we've, we've gone through our COVID pandemic. And, uh, and our building project, unfortunately, is no different. So we've received a new budget uh, not too long ago. And the cost now in this new budget is up to 5.2, almost 5.3 million. So it's an increase of about $875,000. Now that's about a 20% increase. And it's actually fairly reasonable as we've been talking to other people in building projects. We've actually even heard of some who's costs have doubled. So uh, it, it, it was disappointing for us to hear that news, but at the same time with everything that's been going on, it wasn't totally unexpected. So even though that was dis disappointing, we do remain very confident that God wants us to establish a ministry pro presence here on Highway 59 and that he's going to provide the needed funds. At the semi-annual meeting, uh, Robin shared about Nehemiah. And just the challenges and the obstacles that he went through as he uh, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And so we just took that as some extra um, effort for us just to keep going. Because he didn't quit. And he faced a lot of challenges. And so we know that in a building project of this, side, there's gonna, of this size, there's going to be some snags. There's going to be some obstacles. And we just need to keep going. So with that revised budget, I, th I just thought I'd give you a bit of a financial update, and here's where I'll probably just cut back on some of the numbers I gave before. Um, but with the cost now of construction of just under $5.3 million, with uh, what we've already paid kind of taking off of that, plus our current bank balance, which is well over a million dollars, pledges that we've been received but not actually received the money for, so we know about these pledges and, and they just haven't come in yet. Um, as the wind is blowing my papers around. And then a potential mortgage if we, if we end up having to go that route of no more than $1.5 million, we still need to raise, at this point in time, around $1.6 million. Now that may seem really overwhelming, and, and it can be, because that's a lot of money. So I thought I'd just give you a quick idea of where we've, where we've been so far and what we've managed to accomplish to this point in time. So. The land that we're sitting on right now, uh, we've invested $1.1 million in that land. And then when you add to that <coughs> the sale of our church on Oxford Street, donations we've already received, pledges we have not yet received, we received some HST rebates on the purchase of this land, we've accumulated a little bit of interest on the money in the bank, 
We've actually accumulated up to this point in time over $3.5 million towards this project since the very beginning when we were looking for the land. So that is really outstanding, considering especially that we've been through a pandemic for pretty much the whole time we've been working on this project. So I, I would just want to conclude this part of the presentation by saying God has really blessed us greatly already. It's been amazing to see what he's, he's done just through our church, just the number of people that we had out last week and again this week here outdoors. Uh, it's been amazing to see what he's doing, and we know that he's going to see us through to the conclusion of this project. So where do we go from here? So obviously we don't want to start the main construction until we have the funds available. And so we're still working with the construction management company, the engineers, the architects. We want to make sure everything's in place so that when we are ready to go, we can get all the building permits and all the other permits that are needed. So like we're, we're down to the point where we're making a decision of what the doors inside the building going into the auditorium are going to look like. It's just a lot of the nitpicky things that you, you like you, we're almost saying like, why now? But they need to have these on the plan so they can, they can get everything ready to go. Uh, at the semi-annual meeting, Allison, for the capital campaign team, she, she did share that the pledges that we received this past fiscal year for the church were, were quite a bit higher than the year before. And that was uh, really exciting to hear. And really, pledges are an important part of this whole process for us at this point because we can use that pledge number to demonstrate that we've got the funds ready so that when, we're, when, when we get all the funds put together and we can say, yep, yeah, the pledges are here, we know that they're coming, we can actually start the building process. And that's important because, again, with COVID, the number of delays are unbelievable. So we were told if we decided to pull the trigger and start today, we wouldn't actually be able to start building the foundation until the spring of 2023 at the earliest. Because just to get on a schedule, to get the materials here and stuff, even to get steel, they're saying it's between six to nine months now once you order steel to actually get it. So. There's going to be those kinds of delays once we pull the trigger. So that's where uh, we feel the pledges are so important because even though we may not have the cash in the bank yet, we know the money is coming and we can say, yes, get us on the schedule and let's get ready to go. So Allison did share that a number of families have already exceeded their pledges that they made originally. Some have already contacted her and made new pledges. So if you want to make a pledge, if you want to do an, a new pledge, or if you just want to see where your pledges are at, because like me, you've probably lost track and you don't even know if you've hit your pledge total yet or not, please talk to Allison, because she's more than willing to help you and walk you through that. And so that is, is really this all we wanted to update you on today. And so we just want to continue to encourage you, as Nehemiah did, to pray, to listen, and to obey. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, that building update. It's encouraging to hear and even be able to see things going along as we drive by and, uh, and, and drive in and we see a little bit happening each week. We are definitely blessed to have this property. Um, and if you haven't walked around, make sure you walk around after the service today as well. Uh, it, it's a little weedy, but the property does extend far beyond these trees. This is not the edge. So uh, there's a lot of land here. We praise the Lord uh, much better than than when we were struggling to find places to park and even just looking forward to VBS and camps and having some grass area. And um, it's just exciting to see uh, what God has planned for the future. I hope last week that you enjoyed yourselves as we came out here and ate together and um, just had a fun time with some great games. Uh, there was some trophies handed out for some of our, to some people who won. Um, and it was great to just watch everyone have fun and just do sack races and egg tosses and things like that, that it's been just so long since we've been able to do and just uh, enjoy a meal together. It's always good to eat together. This morning as we open God's word, let's, let's begin with prayer and then we'll uh, dig into it together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this beautiful day that you have given us. We thank you, God, that we can meet together and gather together on this land and worship you. God, we thank you for your word which we know is inspired. It is full of truth. We know, God, your word is the way we get to learn about who you are. And we praise you, God, that you have revealed yourself to us through your word. God, I thank you for your spirit, which you give us when we believe in you. You, you have it live inside of us. I thank you, God, that it teaches and instructs us in our daily lives. God, I pray this morning that as we open your, your word and read the book of Acts, that you would just help us to understand you more 
that we would rely on you more, that we would see the amazing truth of the gospel even more clearly again today. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, uh, if Robin this week is away. He uh, had the opportunity to go to BC and visit some people and uh, just get away for the weekend. So we're, he's, I know he's grateful for that opportunity. Uh, and I actually had the opportunity this past week to take a wonderful class on Proverbs. So I'll try not to go into Proverbs too much as we look at Acts this morning. Um, but this morning we're going to look at Acts chapter 3, uh, the whole of the third chapter, and the notes are available online, as are the music, if you didn't get a song sheet, just so you're aware. A- and we're going to look at four W's that I think we see from this passage. We see the wonder, we see the word, we see the way, and we see the witness. And through this, we see God's heart of salvation as he continues to present himself to the Jewish people. Uh, we see from God's word in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for example, that, that God and the gospel was first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And as we go through these first chapters here, we see God sharing the gospel, sharing his good news with the Jewish community. We, sh- we see his heart for them, his love for them. He's been re- relentlessly pursuing them for generations and generations. And we see Jesus has come to save them, uh, ultimately to save the Jews so that the Jews could bring salvation to the world. But as we'll go through the book, we'll notice that that's not exactly how things turned out. So, so far, what we, we've noticed and seen in the end of the Gospels or in the Gospels and also in Acts is that uh, Jesus has been rejected and God, but God's mission, heart, and desire for salvation has not changed. So the first thing we see in chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, is the wonder. Uh, it, it's the account of an amazing miracle that happens. Let's read it together. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John go, uh, about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he, took, and he took him by the hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who had sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So we see this incredible miracle take place. In the the first verse, uh, it's Jewish tradition for the people uh, uh, to go to the temple and pray three times a day. And uh, so there was a morning, a three in the afternoon, and a sunset prayer. And the first two aligned with the daily sacrifices that were happening at the temple. We notice right away that Peter and John don't go to the temple to sacrifice, though they go to the temple for prayer. And Uh, It's important that they don't go to sacrifice because they know and believe and understand that Jesus is their sacrifice. He has paid the price for their sins. They don't need to make these sacrifices any longer. In verses 2 to 5, we learn about this man who is laid at the beautiful gate. Uh, This gate was located on the eastern side of the temple courts. And it's believed to have been made out of Corinthian bronze. And there's some incredible pictures of it online if you look it up. It was absolutely stunning, which is why it was called the beautiful gate. And so we're told that this man was carried there every day by his friends. They brought him there day after day. And they brought him there specifically to ask for elms. So this was a great place for him to be brought. 
because what elms were, it was when people would give him food or money to help him um, survive because he was poor, right? Because he couldn't work because of his disability. And it was seen as a great act of piety for people to offer elms. In other words, people were seen as spiritual because they would give and be seen giving this money or this food to this poor person. And so it made them spiritual and they wanted to be seen as being made spiritual. So Peter and John, they show up, they come to the gate and it's curious. We, we don't know how long this man has been coming there, but we do know that uh, he has been, dis- he is disabled and it seems like he's been there for a very long time. And, and you wonder how many other times had Peter and John crossed by him? Had they seen him before? It, it would be likely that they would. And I mean, it's not long after when Jesus was, was around, it's possible that Jesus would have even seen him as times when he was going into the temple through the gates. But there's something different about today. Peter kind of has a stare down with him a little bit. And in verse six, Peter makes it clear that he doesn't have what the beggar's looking for. He doesn't have gold, he doesn't have silver, but what he does have to offer is something much better. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, he commands him to get up and walk. We've seen Jesus uh, perform miracles often like this throughout the Gospels. So uh, it, it's different in that this time it's coming from Peter, not from Jesus. The miracles we've seen over and over again, and it doesn't make them less miraculous, but it's something we've, we've read before, and we can kind of come, become numb to it as we, we read, read it again. But this time it's Peter and it's John who are there. Jesus is no longer with them anymore. And so uh, he commands them to walk, and in verses 7 to 8, incredibly, the man gets up by the power of Jesus Christ, and in his name he has been healed. He can finally walk. And to me, as I was reading through this and looking at it and studying it, this man, like I said, has probably been there for a a while. So why did it take so long? Why couldn't he just have been healed before? Maybe when Jesus was there, why didn't he get healed last time? We'll talk about that, I think, in in a few minutes. His immediate response, though, is not just to get up, but he ultimately goes, and it says he, give, he gives praise to God. He praises the Lord for healing him. He knows the one who has healed him. See, this is important. We don't want to miss this. If we read the text, it says he was praised, he was healed in the name of Jesus, but he gets up and praises God. See, this man makes the connection. He notices that he was healed in Jesus, but he he was healed in the name of Jesus, but it was by God. Shouldn't he be praising Jesus though? Well, in Acts chapter four, verses uh, 29 to 30, just a little while later, it says, and now Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So we're learning here that, that the healing ultimately came from God through the name of Jesus Christ. It was by God through Jesus. And this is just how God operates. The Father and the Son are always in, in, in response or correlation. They always cooperate with each other. But when they work, it's by the Father through the Son. And that's how this healing takes place today. No doubtably, as he was getting up and running around and praising God, this would have caused a ruckus throughout the temple, right? People realizing, hey, we know this guy. I recognize him. I've seen him before. I've seen him many times before. How come he's up? What happened? We want to hear about it. We want to know. He's praising God. Why is he praising God? He was healed in Jesus' name. Why is he praising God? And for these Jewish people, the, the the, the goal is these connections that are starting to be made. In verses 9 to 10, we see that it doesn't take long for people to notice. They're asking these questions. This was a miraculous sign for them. See, many people today are looking for miraculous signs. 
to know that God is real, to go know that God is involved in their lives. And maybe that's you. Maybe you this morning or these weeks or this last little bit have been asking, God, show me something amazing. Show me that you're real. Show me that you exist. How do I know? See, never in the New Testament do signs ever bring salvation to every, anybody. Instead, they're always pointers to God. They're always opportunities for the word of God to be preached. And so maybe you're here today and you've been asking God for a sign, that he's real, that he loves you, that you should follow him. But see, a sign will never make anybody believe. Many, many people saw Jesus' miracles. Many people will see the sign and will not believe. Signs do not make people believe. But instead, they point and give opportunities for the preaching of God's word. And that's what we see right after. In Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 16, we see the word. It says, Well, he clung to Peter and John, that's the, the man who can now walk. All the people, utterly astonished, ran together to them um, from, the, from the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? as though by your own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had denied and released him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And faith that is through Jesus has given this man his perfect health in the presence of you all. It's very likely that these people would have been and gone here, these Temple goers would have gone many, many, many times before to make sacrifices and, and to pray. And we're told that there was quite a crowd because they end up moving out of these inner circle, the inner courtyards, and they move to Solomon's uh, Colland. It's this large porch area on the eastern side. It's much bigger. It would hold more people. That's likely why they moved. There just wasn't enough space in the inner courts. And so Peter gives an opportunity because of this miracle, because of the wonder that had happened, he has an opportunity to share the word. And that's the pattern we see throughout the New Testament. Miraculous things happen and it gives a platform for the word of God to be shared and salvation to happen. And inside this message, there's two parts to it. There's five truths about Jesus and about God and it's wrapped in these four charges against the people. So first we see the five truths we see in verse 13 that Jesus is God's long-awaited servant. We see also in verse 13 that God glorifies Jesus. These are important things. We can praise the Lord for these things too. We see in verse 14 that Jesus is the holy, the righteous one. We see in verse 15 that Jesus is the author of life. What a title, the author of life. And we see at the end, they can praise God because Jesus is the one who is raised from the dead. Really, he, he testifies and shows who Jesus Christ is from the beginning to the end. This is Jesus. This is who he is. He is the servant, the long-awaited servant. He has been glorified by God. He is holy. He is righteous. He is the author of life, and he is risen. That's his message to them. What awesome things that we can praise God for today. Do you believe them? Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is God's long-awaited servant? Do you believe that Jesus is God's glory, that, that God has glorified Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is the holy and the righteous one? Do you believe that Jesus is the author of life? What an amazing title, the author of life. Do you believe that Jesus is the one whom God raised from the dead? Do you believe that this morning? See, Peter doesn't just give them this feel-good message telling them how great Jesus is. He wraps it with four charges against these people that are specific to them. 
The four charges are this, and you probably remember these from the gospel when you read through it. Verse 13, they delivered Jesus over to Pilate. He charges them with that. You are the ones who, who had him arrested. You're the ones who gave him to Pilate. Also in verse 13, you denied Pilate when he decided to release Jesus. Pilate was going to say, Pilate didn't find anything wrong. He wanted to let him go. And you said, no. Verse 14, you asked for a murderer. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. What charges against these people? Denied Jesus twice. They delivered him. They denied him. They chose, mur- they chose a murderer over him. The epitome of the opposite of who Jesus is, holy and righteous. And they said, we would rather have Barabbas. And they killed the author of life. See, these charges are specific to this group of people at the temple who just weeks, and I mean, it would have been many weeks now, but many weeks before had seen the crucifixion happen, would have been part of it. Maybe in the crowd chanting those days when, when for, for all of those crimes. So we don't exactly relate because we weren't exactly there, but it doesn't mean there aren't charges against us too. See, we're sinful. We hate God. We love evil and hate righteousness. And the list of charges against us is much longer than these four, much greater than these four. And maybe today you know that you have all these charges against you. Maybe you know that you've sinned and you know that you're not perfect. Well, it's true that the wages of sin is death and no amount of good deeds can pay for our sins or, and pay for what we've done. But there is a way and we'll talk about that in a minute. See, for these people, they knew exactly what Peter was referring to, these four specific charges against us, these horrendous crimes that no sacrifice could ever cover. Before we look at the way, though, I think there's something important to notice in verse 16. Here we see the man and learn more about the healing of this man. Notice the wording here. It's very, very, very specific. And I don't know what translation you're using this morning, and I don't want to pick on any single translation. I I think it's great we have so many, and it's great to look at all of them. But from the studying I was doing, um, the NIV rearranges the words to make it more readable, which helps a lot sometimes. But in this case, it, it loses some of its meaning. Let me read verse 16 for you again. Listen to this again. And his name, that's Jesus, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And faith that is through Jesus has given this man the perfect health health in the presence of of you all. Where does the beggar get his faith? Notice that. It's not faith in Jesus. It says that at the beginning. It's faith in Jesus that's through Jesus. The faith comes from Jesus. He was given faith. He received faith. That's different, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it actually lists faith as a spiritual gift. Faith is a spiritual gift. And so maybe Peter looked at him that way because he knew something was different. We talked about that gaze before. But we know here that God was at work. God, through Jesus Christ, gives him the faith so that by faith he can be healed in Jesus' name. Ultimately, so that Peter can share the word. But the faith that this man has didn't come from himself. It came from God. God is the giver of faith. It was through Jesus Christ. That's amazing. There's two takeaways, I think, from that. First, are you lacking in faith this morning? Maybe you doubt and you, you struggle with that. And you look at other people and you're like, they always have so much faith. It seems so much easier for them. Well, have you prayed for it? Have you asked God to fill you with faith? God is the giver of faith. Have you spent time with people that are gifted in faith? These people that you look at and like, man, they always seem to have so much faith. They might be gifted in faith. That's why they have so much faith. God has gifted them faith. Have you spent time with them, eating with them, praying with them, fellowshipping with them, studying God's word together with them? God is the giver of faith. It's amazing. And so 
Ask God for faith. Spend time with others gifted in faith. Let it grow and help and strength your, strengthen your faith. That's why people in our church have been gifted with faith is so that we can spend time with them, so that we can turn to them when we doubt. They are filled with faith. We need them. It's an amazing gift. The second thing that we notice here is that God always uses miracles or signs and wonders so that he can share his word. This is so important for us to make sure we understand. Especially uh, as someone, I grew up in a Baptist church. uh, I went to Faithway. And so one of the things that we often deny, or I don't know, deny, we just push to the side. We have a very high view of God's word and a low view of miracles and all of those types of things happening because we have God's word. It's everything, right? But we see from scripture those, these amazing miracles and stuff happen, but they always, always, always lead to the teaching of God's word. That's why they happen. Miracles lead to God's word. Miracles lead to preaching. Miracles lead to, to the truth being shared. The sign is never the end. It always points to God. It always points you to the truth. And in this case, it points the people to the way, which is what we see in Acts chapter 3, verses 17 to 20. It says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus." Verses 17 to 18 are just amazing, amazing verses. They point out the ignorance of these people. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know that as they had Jesus Christ crucified on the cross, they thought they were winning, but they were actually doing exactly what, what God wanted. They were, act, they, were, they were not that God wanted them to sin, but this was all part of God's plan. It was all to be fulfilling the Old Testament. It's amazing. They thought they were stopping it, but they were actually accomplishing God's plan, which is incredible. And so these people, though, that have sinned this way, that have killed the author of life, what are they to do? Verse 19, they're to repent. Repent. In other words, turn back to God. It's not too late. He still loves them. He still has grace for them. He still has mercy for them come back to God. Repent. It's not a, it's not a message of condemnation saying, you know what? It's too late for you guys now. You guys really messed up. You got Jesus killed. It's over. Saying, you guys, you did this. I understand that, but it fulfilled prophecy. Now come back to God. Come back. Learn about Jesus. Know Jesus. And I love the offer because when they come and repent, their sin will be blotted out, which is amazing. Think of the amount of time that they spent every day through the law with sacrifices, dealing with their sin. Like, it was incredible. It was a big deal. And, and by believing in Jesus Christ, by repenting, that would take it all away. Their sin would be done with. What an amazing offer. And it's an offer that as you look at that verse, verse 19, it says that it will be blot, blot, blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Those people offered the sacrifices over and over and over again, day after day after day, because they wanted to be in God's presence. But how refreshing do you think it was for them to go day after day realizing their sin, killing an animal, having it sacrificed before the sake of their sin, coming there to pray. It, it wasn't a time of refreshment. It was work. It was hard. It was hard for them. And the offer is come now, have your sin dealt with, and enjoy the presence of God every day. Enjoy God's presence. What an incredible and amazing offer. Have for forgiveness and refreshment in Jesus Christ. And that's the offer we have today. That's what God's word offers us today. See, we have all those charges against us, but there is an incredible solution, and that's Jesus. If you learn to look at at Peter's message, we see that. So we were to repent, call out to him, 
Believe that Jesus Christ is God's long-awaited servant. Believe that God has glorified Jesus. Believe today that Jesus is the holy and the righteous one. Believe today that Jesus is the author of life. Believe today that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Believe those things. Repent, turn back to God, and you will be saved just like these people. It's the same promise. What an amazing offer for us. Salvation in the name of Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. So why can we believe this? How do we know? How how can we tell that it's true? Well, Peter gives some explanation after what I've called in the last section, verses 21 to 36, the witnesses. So he now has some witnesses to help support his statement, to back him up, I guess you could say. Starting in verse 21. So it's talking about Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouths of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up from you a, a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you, And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to the prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets whom have spoken from Samuel to those who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are the sons of the prophet and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first, to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. The entire Old Testament is a witness to who Jesus Christ is. And so for these people, Old Testament scholars, guys who studied, who memorized it, the whole thing, it's incredible. Peter points and shows them again, as he often does, that from Moses, Samuel, and everybody after him, including Abraham, who is before everybody, points to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all of the covenant promises. So why should should the Jews believe? Because God said that he was going to save his people 1,500 years before this, and he's done it. He fulfilled his promises. He's keeping his covenants. We can trust in the name of Jesus because God has been faithful from the beginning. That's what he's calling them to. Remember how faithful God has been. This is why you can trust it. His word shows you that you can trust it. Why can you trust Jesus? Because God is faithful. From Adam onward, he has promised salvation and he has brought it through Jesus. The Bible tells, tells us all about God's amazing covenant of love, that, that the love that he has for us. We're reading a story this morning that is about 2,000 years old. Isn't that amazing? This happened 2,000 years ago. We have a copy of it. And from every, every hi- from a, a, a issue of history or anything, if you look into it, it is one of the most, it is the most historically accurate document on the planet, like bar none. There is nothing that has the number of manuscripts and study and continuity in multiple languages for generations that, our, that the Word of God does. It is incredibly accurate. We're reading a story from 2,000 years ago talking about the fulfillment of promises that God made 1,500 years before that. When we look at history, the, the evidence of the Bible being accurate and true is unparalleled. That what we have is God's word is incredible. Even just the fact that God has protected it through everything, year, generations after generations, through the Roman Catholic Church, nothing, it's never been lost. It can't be snuffed out. We have it. We have God's copy or his word in our hands. And every time we find something in history, it always just bolsters our, the truth. Like it never contradicts it. It's incredible. This book The Bible, the Word of God, is the incredible, inspired Word of God, and it tells us who God is. And you can look into it, and you will see over and over and over again just how accurate it is. But on top of that, when we read from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the other thing that we see, this this is the heart of God, and we also see it just, everything makes sense. This Word, 
This Bible explains everything in our world. It explains why the world is the way it is. It explains why we are the way we are. When we look at the world through the lens of scripture, the world makes sense. It gives us truth to hold on and stand on. God's word is so important. So why do we believe the gospel? Because it's in God's word. Why do we believe God's word? Because it's accurate. We believe God's word because it's, it's true. That it, when we perceive the world through it, everything makes sense. It actually works. That's why we believe God's word. So this morning, as we kind of come to a conclusion, I love the end here. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first, that's to the Jews, to bless you by turning every one of you away from your wickedness. Isn't that amazing? God wants these Jewish people to turn away from sin and to come to him. And that same desire, he says to you first, he says to you first, not because, he didn't say to you only. It's because the gospel's gonna go out. So that today, 2,000 years later, we can have the same message. God's desire is that you will come to him and turn away from wickedness. You will love him and hate sin. That he will learn about who Jesus is and it will change your life forever and ever. That he will be glorified in your lives. That's his desire, is his glory in your life. We see from these words, we see this awesome wonder, a miraculous sign that allowed for the preaching of the word, which gave a way, a way for them to be saved. And it was supported by the witnesses of the Old Testament. Next week, we'll see how they receive it, or Robin Robin's preaching. They don't receive it well, but I pray that today that we receive it well. We receive it much better than they did. You see, they arrest him. I hope I don't get arrested today for doing this, right? That's not the goal, that you all arrest me. But this is an incredible, incredible passage for us that we too can have salvation. And I hope that's encouraging you for you this morning. You can have salvation in Jesus Christ. And if you are saved, look at yourself. Look at what God has done for you. Isn't that amazing that God has given you salvation? And then the challenge that we should go to our neighbors, our coworkers, our families and friends because God desires their salvation too. God wants them to know this word. God wants them to know the way. Awesome quote. I forget exactly who said it. But it's, why wait for a call when you've been given a command? We're called to go. Share the gospel. Tell people this awesome word tell people about the amazing way of Jesus Christ. We have witnesses to support us. Sometimes God will use wonders to help us, but that doesn't mean or change what our goal or or, our purpose is today, is to share the gospel, to love others, to glorify God. See, Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he and he is the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Come to Jesus this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, God, for what he has accomplished on the cross. That he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. God, you died. You took the place, our place of death so that we have a way to know you, to love you, to be in your presence, to enjoy the refreshment, to have our sins blotted out. God, I pray that we would just experience that today. We would experience the refreshment of knowing salvation. We would experience the joy of being in a relationship with you. God, will you just fill our hearts with praise as we sing this song to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we have the opportunity to celebrate communion together. It is a proclamation of believers that we are witnesses of the amazing things that God has done. That we have no, that we know Jesus Christ. That we believe in Jesus Christ. And that we can celebrate and remember together, because we often forget so easy, what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so if you need a communion cup, you can raise your hand and the ushers will make sure you get one if you didn't get one on the way in. I want to encourage you though, if you don't know Jesus this morning, if he's not your Lord and your Savior, then please just let this pass. Um, This is for believers. Today we celebrate 
communion as a reminder of what Jesus Christ has done. And so as we partake together, let me read from God's word. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is the body. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the bread together. God, we thank you that you sent your, gen- your son, Jesus, that he became a man. He took on flesh. God, we thank you that he died on the cross. His body was broken that we might have life in you. As we eat this today, I pray that you would just encourage us and remind us of the cost and the amazing grace that we have received. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. We're told that in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim the Lord's death as we pray and then partake. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed. Your word shows us clearly that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And we see throughout the Old Testament the amount of bloodshed that was required to cover and pay for sin. God, thank you for Jesus' blood. Thank you that it was enough, that it will cover over the sins of all who believe in you. We praise you, God, for that. God, allow us to just see the importance of your forgiveness today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake and proclaim together. Today, as we conclude the service, I have one more scripture reading I'd like to share with all of you. Psalm chapter 71, verses 18 and 19 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, whom alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. May God bless you as you go today.